examples are very thankful to make trade, Sweden on the go, Companion Stockholm, and DevRel events, developer relations events, which is Ulex company. So I'm very thankful to my co-director, Ulex, who is here, Jens, who is our mentor, uh, uh, and he is running the Hong Kong chapter. Amanda runs a couple of startups and she is looking after the social media. Marina has a consulting practice in Go Beyond 2030 and she is our community lead. Uh, Uleg runs a very interesting startup, as I said, DevRel Events. So do check them out. Hey. Hi, Caroline. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. Really thankful that you could make it. And uh, we are very hopeful that audience will find your experience on the two sides of entrepreneurship, building a venture from inside and the building ventures from outside. Quite interesting for today's discussion. Um, so let's start. Let, why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself, education, about uh, uh, your own background, your personal background, interests. Yeah. Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Caroline Bodderu. Um, I've always loved solving problems. Um, that started already when I was 14. I saw, you know, there's no good bread here and I'm a foodie. I thought I can bake bread and go knocking door to door, uh, selling bread to my neighbors. Uh, so that was my first startup experience. And I, you know, did school newspaper and societies at university. Um, so that's one of my driving forces. When I see a problem, I like, like going out and solving it. Um, and I like understanding the world from lots of different perspectives and then finding creative ways forward. Mm, and I studied biology at a university. I was at Cambridge University. So one of my favorite things is, you know, understanding through that lens, like how do animals work, people, genetics, ecosystems. Uh, it's just so exciting and complex. And uh, yeah, I'm 30 now. Um, so I finished my bachelor's uh, almost 10 years ago and actually started a research master's at Cambridge, um, looking at like the protein basis of memory, uh, but realized I didn't want to sit with test tubes, uh, preferred working with whole people and groups rather than like proteins. Um, so yeah, so that's when I came back to Sweden and thought, you know, hey, maybe uh, I, I joined a startup as the first employee. And then realized, you know, this is what I want to do and uh, started my own company one year later, which is now eight years ago. And that's, uh, I don't know if you can see, but volumental. Yes, we can see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brilliant. What an interesting journey uh, starting from. Uh, so you are an entrepreneur from the days of selling bread and the school magazines. Is, is yeah. that so? Uh, yeah, you can do that. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Uh, I also read that. Uh, you in 2013, you were number one Swedish super talent of the year, and then Forbes 30 and the 30 Europe's leaderboard. So tell us a little bit about that. Mm. Uh, yeah, I was very unprepared for the, when I was 23 uh, on that uh, that leaderboard for for super talents under under 40 in Sweden. Um, but uh, yeah, it's I mean, uh, the strange thing is about these. Um, awards for me is that they don't really like match like when I feel things are going the best in the company and everything's great that's not when I feel like we're getting all the awards it's often the case where it's like you're in a really tough patch and you're like what the hell am I getting this award? <laughs> everything is chaos um but it's it's nice to get them and usually they have fun you know parties and communities around it and uh I hope it can be like a sort of inspiration for other people I guess to see that you know you don't have to be uh super techie to start tech companies and uh it's really fun to do entrepreneurships okay um but if, you, if we take your uh, education uh cambridge and then uh, biology and startups or entrepreneurship what attracts you to entrepreneurship or the startup world like what are, what do you think is the thing that uh, like um, brings you in into this side of the world yeah, it's as I said, it's about the problem solving. So for me, entrepreneurship is really about seeing and solving problems. And entrepreneurship is the absolutely best way that I found to do that. Uh, so and then you get to work with a fun group of people who are all aligned towards a goal and working to solve that with all their heart. And that's the most sort of exhilarating experience ever for me. Um, and I'm not very, I think I'm... Uh, I'm very stubborn and not very good at taking uh, 
orders from anyone unless I understand why uh, I'm doing it. And I found that it's easier than if, if I'm out solving a problem I care about and find people who want to do that with me, uh, I'm much more motivated than if someone else is telling me what to do. So, so you think problem solving is your thing when you come into entrepreneurship. And that's where what, what I uh, kind of hear from you is that when you are together with people who are trying to solve it together, you think problem solving works better when one works in teams. Yeah, for sure. Especially because I'm not a specialist. I need okay. I need pros to actually build the products with me. Um, okay. Do it on my own. Yeah. But but many entrepreneurs. Uh, so so in entrepreneurship, one tends to see a, a kind of tendency of some people to work on the solo side. So that's also a big part of entrepreneurship: solo companies and solo ventures, uh, solo consulting practices. But then we have the startup side, where you kind of build team structure. So your side is the startup side. You think? Yeah, I, I definitely think teams are, you know, both with my investor hat and my entrepreneur hat, I'd say having uh, co-founders to build something with is okay. very important for success. And what are some of the successful ingredients? So let's say the, like a problem binds the team together in terms of like they're trying to solve something. But what are some of the things that you've found over your period of time which kind of act as a glue for the team like mm -hmm. how do teams stick together yeah yeah well i mean the absolutely easiest one is to solve a problem that you all care a lot about uh because then you'll stick together even when it's tough and uh it'll be easier to say well the big impact we're making is x and therefore all this the politics or all the other shit along the way mm -hmm. is not going to matter as much. So that's the main thing. Um, so you need to find people who really care about that and are not, I call it, uh, entrepreneurs, like people who just want to start a company. That's not, okay. you know, that's not a great, uh, motivation. You need to, you need, it's good to have that, but you also need to really care about the problem. Um, and other glue, um, one of the things that I found very helpful at Volumental is from the beginning, always discussing expectations and like the culture we want to build together and what we didn't want to do and to revisit that very regularly. Uh, and that's great because then you can always link back to those expectations that, you know, you're agreed on. And uh, in a time that is tough, you can then look back mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, these are the, the tenets, the core principles we set. So that's a good way to, you know, those are good bases then for solving problems. And that also helps then when you share very clearly in recruitment and such uh, what the expectations are and the plan so that you also get a lot of self-selection so that you you filter out all the people. People won't even apply to your company if they don't agree with the, the values and such. Uh, and then you, you're, there's less chance of getting this uh, mismatch. So and that's really something cool. we always have to work on. I mean, we're 50 people now, and it's, it's tricky <laughs> always to keep doing this. Um, okay. okay. So problem solving, uh, culture and values, very clearly communicated. I think great learning uh, for our community. I hear some feedback in my own uh, kind of a headset. Uh, Ulek, if you can message me, if uh, I'm just wanting to know if that kind of thing is coming for the audience as well. I, I, I hear quiet. my double sound. Yeah. I can make you guys quieter. Okay. Uh, is it better? Can uh, Michael, you wrote it uh, that you were hearing it. Can you still hear it? The double to uh, sound? If you can write on the chat. No, gone for now. Brilliant. That's the mm. community response we want active brilliant uh, so so great learnings for the startups here that uh, going into a problem together clearly communicating expectations and then you brought in two soft things which is the culture and the values that you are trying to create and that you gave a very good example where you said that you kind of auto select the right talent if you are careful on that side brilliant we move on to discussing a little bit about your let's start with volitude ventures and mm -hmm. if you could give out uh, some uh, sort of detail, because you uh, till now we have talked about your entrepreneurship journey. Yeah. That's which, like, what's Wallyru Adventure? What's your role there? What are you guys after? Which markets you're focusing on? Yeah. Over to you. So Wallyru Adventures is it's a family office. So it's myself and my two parents, and we're all entrepreneurs. 
Um, and we realized in 2015 uh, that uh, all of us were uh, just rolling off an entrepreneurship journey. So my mom had been CEO and co-founder of a startup which had just been sold. I had just quit being CEO of Volumental and switched to chairman. Uh, and my father as well was um, leaving the pricing consultancy startup that uh, he had founded and was partner at. So we were all sitting there like, what should we do next? Um, and we all love the entrepreneurship side and thought, why don't we try to do something together? And in, uh, well, we were the first investors in Klarna, okay. uh, the fintech unicorn. Uh, so we had some cash uh, mm -hmm. to invest in startups. So we just invest our own money into really early stage deep tech companies mm -hmm. uh, that are uh, doing something great for the living planet. Um, and generally, well, we exclusively focus on the Nordics, uh, primarily Swedish companies. And that's because we want to be able to meet the startups regularly. So um, compared to other investors where an investment manager might have between like five and 20 different startups that they're responsible for in a portfolio, we do... Um, only have two active companies at once per person, meaning we can max do like five or six companies at a time. Uh, so that, that means like I'm working two days a week at Volumental and I work two days or a week at another uh, portfolio company. And those, those are the two things I do other than like a bit of, you know, things like this and um, community building and stuff in the last day. Uh, so we're very operative, hands-on, and we want to help super deep tech founders um, to innovators to build commercial successes out of their companies. And it's okay that it takes longer time. Um, like a lot of investors as well, they have funds that are like, well, they need to get their money back in seven years. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have that issue. We can be more long-term. Okay. But, but deep tech is a, a good space because I remember uh, my discussion with Pat Hedbury from Sting uh, in the last uh, fireside chat because he was saying that uh, we don't have that enough here in Stockholm or in Sweden, uh, the investment side on the deep, deep tech side. What do you think is the situation with deep tech investment in Sweden right now? Do we have enough startups? And number one, and number two, if the startup uh, quantum is there, do we have enough investment opportunities mm. or investment flow going to mm. these startups? I think we could do so much more on the deep tech side in Sweden. Um, so I don't think there's ever enough deep tech startups because there's so many important problems out there to solve, right? Okay. And the way to solve the big problems is usually through uh, like some pretty amazing new innovations and technology. Mm -hmm. So, and in 20, 30 years, we must have solved uh, the climate crisis we're in and yeah. like the way our consumption patterns are at the moment. And if we don't solve that, I mean, we're kind of screwed. So mm -hmm. we need to build for that future <laughs> where we have solved those problems. So, so I think that's definitely the case that we need more of those. And in terms of like how we could get more of those startups, mm -hmm. I think one of the issues we have in Sweden is that we have a lot of um, uh, separation between the different uh, universities. So, for example, like tech people mm -hmm. go to maybe KTH or Chalmers or Linköping or, or somewhere, and business people go to Handels or like Indec at KTH or something. And there's not all that much um, interaction between these groups, uh, meaning that. Uh, like a really great tech person who has an amazing technology doesn't really know who to talk to, doesn't have a lot of business people they trust who they could start a tech startup with. And the same way the other way around, where there's lots of people, lots of students and just people in general who would love to be like a co-founder, CEO, business person at a startup, but they, uh, and maybe they even have a great idea they want to build, but then they are like, yeah, but we need the tech team to build that. And they don't know a lot of tech people. And I think we need more um, initiatives like Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship uh, and other, other things that mesh these two groups. I think that it's a very important point that uh, that you have raised because I think in large organizations as well, we have silos. So uh, your point of education being developed in a vertical uh, yeah. kind of coordinates, yeah. it's probably the learning needs to be the lateral uh, connection between different disciplines. I, yeah. in fact, remember an interesting, I did a master's from Linnaeus University uh, a couple of years ago. 
they have an interesting program where they bring design, tech, and business together into a combined master. And I've seen a lot of early stage ideas forming in that kind of program. Mm -hmm. so, so great learning over here. Um, one more question about um, Valirud Ventures or the experience that you have there. How different is it from your entrepreneur role? So because as an entrepreneur, you're a creator, you're kind of a hands-on, or is it the same? Do you feel a switch? Like to, when you go from two days here to two days there, is it a different hat? Is it a different pers person that you become or what? Yeah, so it's hard to say uh, because, I mean, there's definitely a difference for me now being uh, founder and chairman of Volumental rather than founder and CEO. And the CEO role is an incredibly challenging uh, role. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm quite uh, happy, to, thankful that someone else wanted to take that on five years ago. Um, so that's definitely a difference, but it is similar. And that's the thing that's, I think that an, um, like a normal investor would say that there's a huge difference. But since we go in and like support the CEO and the founders on whatever needs to get done, um, I mean, like this week, I'm like I like just before Christmas for one of our portfolios uh, companies, I wrote like a a grant application, an application for a loan from Adlami. I'm building their website, and uh, you know we're discussing like financing models and like go to market like because it's just yeah. me and like the three founders uh and like one or two other employees so it's incredibly hands-on and it's just okay. so fun the way that the thing that i'm so thankful about in the role i can have is that i can you know uh i don't have lots of things that i must do on a day-to-day -day basis as a ceo has like all the day-to-day yeah. yeah. -day. but then when the CEOs that we work with come and say, oh my God, like, wow, it turns out, you know, our finance model is, you know, oh, we have, we don't have anything on this side or, oh, we really need more money, but we don't have time. You know, then I can say, okay, well, I can build that model or, okay, well, let me put together a couple applications. And uh, it's just so much fun uh, being that close to the company. Okay. So, so it's fun being hands-on with, starting up teams uh, and then one can bring all that learning in when you're assessing uh, ventures which you take in what is it that you look for entrepreneurs before mm. you give them a place in valued ventures mm. how how does that work is it a particular apart from the tech side you're saying that the area focus needs to be deep mm. tech. fine that's a given but then how, what's the differentiating factor? You yeah. Know? So deep tech, as you say, uh, it has to be positive impact um, somehow. Um, uh, we want there to be a founding team, mm -hmm. okay. uh, not just one founder. If it's a really great idea, technical idea with a technical founder, we can help to try to find a co-founder. Okay. Um, but it's better if you come with with a full like a full team of two three people who have you know a bit of product customer and tech understanding. Got it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, uh, there's obviously there's there's lots of things. One thing that happens sometimes is people will reach out and say, "Hey, I have five ideas. I'm running these five different projects. You want to invest in one of them?" And that's not. We want people who are like fully committed to okay. the product uh, project. Uh, or at least, you know, they're willing to quit their day jobs. Maybe they haven't managed to do that yet, uh, but uh, they will do that and work on the company full time. Uh, and that they want to build a product company, not just like a, like a patent portfolio, which they will license or something like that. Yeah. Um, cause that's, and that's not cause these other, um, paths are necessarily bad. It's just that that's what we enjoy working with. Um, okay. and since we are spending one, two days a week, at the startups we invest in for the first one or two years, there has to be this very strong personal connection where we feel like, wow, this is a fun person. I want to work with them. I'm excited about the market. Mm. Um, and uh, maybe this maybe this is also a bit uh, odd for people where people will reach out and say, hey, you invested in this company and we do something similar. So don't you want to invest there as well? And we say, well, actually, we like it when our companies are very separate so that we don't get any conflicts of interest. And also because it's just fun doing new stuff and learning new markets. Uh, so we don't want to do like the same thing over and over again. Perfect. Perfect. I think a very good picture. I'll just summarize it for our audience. Maybe there are 
uh, deep tech entrepreneurs already listening to it. Uh, you can find all the details at Bollywood Ventures uh, page. But what Carolyn is saying, I'm summarizing here that there has to be a big problem because we started the interview. Carolyn jumped in and said big problem. So there has to be a big problem that you're solving. Deep tech needs to be your focus. And then we heard Carolyn say that there should be some impact which is measurable. Uh, of course, they're looking for uh, teams rather than solos, but if this is a really great idea, they can help you uh, with some sort of networking and kind of building, but you have to show full commitment. So I mm -hmm. think that's what I hear from uh, what you're saying. Brilliant, let's move on to Volumental. Okay, uh, tell me, how did this start? Where did this start? Was it a student venture that kind of built up or, so let's go back, really, really back in time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if we go back to the very beginning, it's 20 years ago. It was like nine, 10 years old. And already we were, I was on a trip with my parents, I think Southern Europe somewhere. And uh, my bag had gotten lost. And there were no shoes in my size that okay. I could buy. Uh, not even, you know, like sandals that have an open front. There were no women's shoes that I could fit into. And I felt like a monster. Uh, like, how is there nothing uh, that I can buy? And, you know, how is there no, not a single pair of women's shoes that fit mm -hmm. me? Um, so since then, I've had to wear mostly men's shoes. And I usually have blisters. Um, and it's just, it really sucks. And that's just something I have lived with and assumed is just a way of the world. Um, and then... Um, uh, as I mentioned, when I got back from uh, Cambridge, I realized, you know, I want to work with, with people okay. and not uh, be a researcher or something. And I, I really tried to find, you know, other things to do. As I said, my parents are entrepreneurs. I wanted to make sure I wasn't just like mimicking them, following their footsteps. So I really tried, like I applied for other jobs. I did internships. I tried research and that. Nothing really fit. And I realized startups is what I want to do. Um, so I went looking for co-founders. Um, this is a tip for any business person or that doesn't have a great idea of their own. I just reached out to like the technology transfer, uh, offices and like innovation hubs at different universities. Uh, now there are things like Antler, uh, Sting, other places you can go and say, Hey, I'm like a business person. I'm looking for to co-found a tech startup. I'd like this space. So that's what I did. And I found a bunch of different companies, but I really fell in love with uh, these three guys at KTH who were doing their mm -hmm. PhDs in computer vision, uh, trying to uh, do 3D scanning of the world. Like you could wave around a Kinect camera, like an Xbox camera, basically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and get a 3D model of whatever you were looking at. Um, and we decided to start a company together. I said, you know, I, I'll work for a few weeks for free if we like each other. Like, let's write a shareholders agreement. Um, so that happened in, uh, like, November, December 2012. And uh, we realized, you know, one of the hardest things to describe is the human body. Um, yeah. And the way shopping works, both in stores and online today, it's like a size medium or like a size 42 or whatever. It doesn't really say anything compared to, like, the eight plus measurements you'd want to get a good fit. Um, so we started digging into that, did like 15 different business model canvases uh, <laughs> to like, and went out, talked to lots of potential customers to try to figure out like, where would this make sense? And one of the areas which made most sense was uh, footwear and insoles and things like that. And that's when it came back to, okay, but this is a problem I have. And my parents are also very tall and have big feet. And, you know, I just, this is a huge problem and I, we need to solve it and we can solve it uh, with mm. monumental. Um, so that's really where, where it started. Um, and uh, it took us a long time to build a product that really uh, worked. And it wasn't until like, early 2016 when we launched uh, the product, which is now out in stores. Uh, and I'd love to share, can I share um, like my screen and show a couple of things or do you have yeah, any other questions yes, first? We, no, no, please go ahead. Yeah. We can keep the questions coming. Yeah, let's it's, see. It's good if we can explain the uh, yeah, volumental to the audience. Uh -huh. Why is it not coming up? Um, sorry. Yeah, here we go. Uh, so I think, can you see my screen? 
Yes, I can yes. see it if somebody... Uh, Great. So this is just to explain the problem for those who haven't had as much trouble as me finding shoes. So these are all feet that are the same length, but look how much they can differ in width or also like in heights, for example. And there's, uh, it's really, you know, impossible to find shoes that fit just from looking at them or like saying like size 42 or something like that. Um, so this is the problem. And what Vol Volumental is solving then is that you get a 3D scan of your feet and then you try on all the shoes in the world instantaneously to get a suggestion of which shoes will fit you best based on your actual foot shape. And that's based on the uh, 7.5 million people we've scanned. So like 15 million feet in our database, um, as well as like who, what they've bought, um, things like that. And um, this is what it looks like. So actually if I, yeah, so she's just been scanned on a scanner and then you get your measurements and then you get recommendations of shoes, uh, the ones that will fit best in the inventory. And it can also work like that online. Um, and the idea is to really help uh, every like person in the shop uh, become shoe dogs, like experts. Uh, and then if you put in your email, you can actually get an email where you get your uh, foot measurements home um, to your inbox. And then you can use that to shop online as well. Um, so that's the huge improvement um, on today. And obviously like we're building loads more in this space. But this is a dream come true for some people. I remember uh, I've always had a problem with shoe shopping because traditionally when I was young, when I, uh, I used to run a lot and play a lot in, in my school days. So I would be needing sports shoes every now and then when I'll go into stores at that time, like I'm talking a couple of decades ago, you'll go in and there'll be these vertical measurements for shoes. So you'll say, okay, your foot length is this much, but somehow the same length would not fit for me. I'll mm -hmm. always need to buy two sizes bigger for my foot because my feet are kind of wider. Yeah. Uh, but so, but then if you buy something which is a shoe shape which is uh, wider, then it becomes odd because the size is not fitting your fo foot. So you force fitted the width for you, so you end up not walking in your perfect way. So this must be an interesting thing for both the shoppers and maybe for the retailers as well, because there's a lot of value for retail to really know the right yeah. size. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, that's one thing we want to make the whole cycle more data-driven because today it turns out like a lot of... Um, uh, shoe designs are based on last, like the wooden blocks that you stretch the, the shoe like material over that have not really been tested or compared to what people's feet look like nowadays. Uh, so, and people's feet are different in different geographies, men and female, male and female feet are different. There's all these things which we're not taking into account. And often you're like, you create one test shoe and you test that on one size of, of foot, one or two people. Okay. And then you just say, let's scale that up and down. And no one really knows where these like scaling tables come from. So they're not actually based on real data. So already in the design phase, we help companies then and say, if someone wants to create a, a, a new running shoe for women or for people in a certain geography, we can help them like, okay, well, this is the things you should think about. And then in the next stage, we can say, well, the types of people, like the types of feet that have walked into your store in your uh, location on like a Tokyo high street are this types of feet. So you should think about which types of shoes you are uh, shipping uh, to that inventory. And then again, if you are doing online, you can then reduce returns. And also there's so much you can do. I mean, in, in terms of making sure then that, that the shoes that are produced actually fit people because there's an enormous amount of waste in the system. And I believe that if we make sure that people get shoes that really fit uh, them and they're like customized without it getting super expensive, then we can find a way to like, actually change our consumption pattern so that we're mm -hmm. doing things, uh, so we're keeping our products longer rather than all this fast fashion. Uh, so there's a lot of different touch points there. Um, and our customers, the ones that are paying us today are the, the footwear brands and the retailers. So it's free for the, the consumer. But we realize we always have to keep the shopper in focus because in the end, that's what is going to you know create a great product that people wanna use. Okay. 
Uh, how big is the difference geographically? Because you mentioned ge geography in several points, like in terms of continents, in terms mm. of, let's say, cities. So yeah. is that a big factor in this measurement process? Um, uh, so today we look at people like the person who gets scanned. We look at their feed and tell okay. them based on that. Uh, we have um, a VP of footwear research at the company who has like several patents in footwear design and how feet fit to shoes. And uh, he's like doing his PhD on footwear fit, which is so cool. Um, and we managed to, to steal him from uh, Slovenia. And uh, he's working on this. And we actually published a nature paper on this. Um, okay. So you can look there. And that's there we've analyzed uh, 1.2 million uh, feet and trying to understand how uh, it differs across, uh, you know, like the scale. Like when you increase the length of a foot, it doesn't decrease or it doesn't increase in width, like okay. at the exact same feet. There's things like that. Um, and like heel width and ball width are different. Um, so there's loads there and we're trying to do way more in that space and are hiring for mm -hmm. like data science teams to be able to do more there. Cause it's so ridiculous that we are like producing shoes with almost no data on people's actual, you know, foot shape. So why are we doing that? Why aren't we actually basing it on, on real people? So what stage you think like every entrepreneur or a founding team has a dream, like, this is what we will become. Maybe we'll mm -hmm. become the size of Facebook or Bill Gates empire, or today we are here. So on, on a scale, on, on a wish scale or a dream scale, where to, to what extent or to what level have you reached in these eight years that you're talking about? Mm. And so are you like, um, are you starting up? Are you, have you done the startup phase and you are kind of an, expansion phase how would you yeah. kind of uh, self-assess yourself yeah so um i like steve blank's definition of a startup and steve blank is i think my favorite startup guru and he has got lots of good online resources so he says that um a startup is the search for a scalable uh, business model Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that we have reached so we have a uh, great product market fit on our uh, retail, like our in-store solution. And that's selling really well. We have over 70, com uh, 70 customers uh, in over 2000 stores. And that's where we're like, every year we're more than like doubling the number of users we have. So we're gonna be at 500 million people, a billion feet uh, by 2025. Okay. Uh, so that's, you know, that's going really well. And of course, like 2021, now we're launching lots of new products uh, as well to make sure we're reaching people, not just in store. Um, so, so a billion feet, feet yeah okay a billion feet in 2025 and you're yeah. right now at 7.5 million scans yeah. or feet at uh, 7.5 million people okay so. So. 50 million people yeah. yeah so we're um and another way to answer your question mm. is that there is i mean there's billion dollar companies that are yeah. have solved yeah. the infrastructure around shopping right like mm. amazon klarna shopify and they're really doing like the basic like just like show you all the products make it easy to pay and like make it easy to get the product uh but think about like the shopping experience i mean at least when i shop and i think when most people shop a lot of the value in shopping is about okay you get to feel the product you get to try it on you know that it'll fit you you like the like it's it's all these other parts. And then of course there's like, yeah, paying and getting it delivered, but those aren't the main things. And that's the part Volumental is solving. So in many ways, I see us becoming like just as important a puzzle piece as these billion dollar companies uh, that are solving the basic buying infrastructure. Cause they're still, stay, they're still selling refrigerators the same mm -hmm. way you sell shoes, which is ridiculous because you can't just pick a size and a color uh, when it comes to footwear. And the same for any, clothing uh, or anything that touches your body. So that's where I guess the title of this um, talk com comes from was like building a world that fits you. And that's our long-term vision, right? Okay. Where anything you see that you might want to buy is already or can be customized so that it fits your body perfectly. Okay. So uh, you're building a solution which has uh, a business fit for a lot of retailing companies, shoe, uh, footwear companies, uh, but at the same time, you're building something which has a lot of appeal to the consumer side as well. 
where you think your heart is as a startup are you a consumer kind of focus on the business player or how do you manage this uh, the two sides yeah. yeah uh good question so we've decided that it is absolutely most important to make sure that the end users the shoppers are happy and get the best service uh because that long term is what is going to build like a great company and a great product also for the retailers if we start um making the product worse for shoppers mm. for some other reasons then then in the end that is going to make it worse for everybody okay got it got it in building the startups what are some of the issues that you faced or some challenges what you think would be the core challenges that have been in the part of building this startup like uh, volumental up to this date mm. what are two or three three things that you have struggled with as a yeah, yeah. many things <laughs> <laughs> we can focus on one or two <laughs> yeah 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 i'll pick a couple uh, so one um Probably the trickiest one for me is I get I get so excited and want to do too much. Um okay. and uh always prioritizing and being very clear on uh why we're doing things and are we doing uh are we doing everything to reach our like first goal rather than doing like 10 different things at once. Um so for an example is where uh until 2015 we had a uh, like three different uh you could even say four different products which we were trying to build at the same okay. time um and that was not good so eventually we killed three of those and if we'd done that earlier uh we would have had more time and probably much more quickly get to a, a situation where we had users we were getting metrics and, and we were iterating in a good way mm. so that's why prioritizing or focus or kind of being razor sharp into yeah. what you are doing and why you how strongly it links back to your why okay yeah okay mm. brilliant i think that's uh, that's uh, uh, a very common startup uh, problem uh, especially early stage startups because it's uh, not very clear which path your business can go and you are a lot in experimental but as you attain fit in the market you are much it can become much quicker for you uh, to scale up <laughs> brilliant where are you headed with volumental if if we may speak like where do you see is there a particular geography that is becoming attractive to you how, how is the evolution journey been so far yeah that's an interesting one so a lot of startups uh, scale geographically right start with sweden then maybe go to norway or germany and then go on from there our first customer was in australia ah okay uh, and uh Uh, this was in the days when we uh were not very good at websites we had the wrong contact email on our website <laughs> and somehow he this customer in australia managed to find our um i shouldn't even, i don't know if i should be telling them um <laughs> find okay, our okay. Uh, one of my co-founders phone numbers on like the yellow pages mm. and, and called him at like 3 a.m. and it's like i want your thing he's like oh what is this is awesome <laughs> uh, So so that was our first customer um but um and now we're in uh over 40 countries i think it's 42 countries mm -hmm. so uh but generally we scale with the HQ right so that's been our scaling strategy working with the headquarters and then um going from there uh to help like with them pushing out to all their flagship stores and the next level stores mm -hmm. mm. uh okay. what was what was your question uh it's like where are you headed with this how oh, yeah okay that was so i answered kind of the wrong question yeah so uh so obviously we want to grow uh more geographically we've only yeah. like touched the surface i mean we're only in uh we're in over 2000 stores but that's nothing compared to all the the stores out there um we focused especially on uh running and performance sports because that's where it's most important to have a great mm -hmm. fit mm -hmm. uh but of course this is important also for uh like dress shoes any any shoe uh it's important for e-commerce to decrease returns uh so we are that's one way of seeing our expansion mm. 
Mm. In terms of team, we're 50 people now. Okay. And uh, we've just, uh, like, we've signed, we've had a very good uh, 2020. And we've signed lots of new customers. So uh, instead of, like, a Series A, we basically made that much money as a Series A investment would be in terms of in customer money. So we're Brilliant. expanding and hiring 15 people now to our team. And that's obviously a huge, like, uh, challenge uh, to mm. find the right, like, awesome people who will be able to, like, do their roles better than anyone uh, who's at the company today. So, yeah, so that's really exciting. Um, Got it. Got it. Brilliant. A couple of questions, and then we uh, switch to uh, Marina. Uh, I hope you're, uh, yeah, you're collecting some of the audience questions and those coming directly to you. Um, COVID-19, it just happened out of the blue. It mm. continues to kind of disrupt the world with whatever... Uh, cause disruptions in the world. Disrupt is, an, uh, is a different word. Um, how is that going to impact retail and you being a retail integrated solution? How does that impact you or yeah. where does that go? Yeah, March looked pretty bleak. Okay. <laughs> uh, most of our customers are in the US uh, and we saw like from, you know, a very steady increase, we saw like a plunged to basically zero usage. Uh, no person walking into any store and getting scanned during, uh, during a week or two. So we were pretty freaked out. Um, mm -hmm. And we did a lot to make sure we had like a 20 months plan. So even if the world goes to hell for 20 months and there's no new business, we will survive. Um, so that was one of my big projects during the spring. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, what we see with, with retail there is that it's becoming so much more important for these companies uh, to be able to connect with their customers even outside the store. And one thing that was really cool is that even though we saw that like the, the new scans plunged to almost nothing for a few weeks, um, we had a huge amount of people um, re-accessing their scans. So going like into that old email from Volumental and looking at uh, like what, what's my, my size, my width, which types of shoes will fit me. Um, and that's something then that, that they can use, that users can use to shop online better. And um, one thing that retailers and footwear brands will have to do is to make sure that they're creating uh, really excellent uh, experiences for their yes. customers, whether it's like in a store um, or online, because people are not just doing one or the other. People are researching online, then going to store. There's all combinations. And that's a place where we can come in as well, helping um, helping to create that like loyalty. And like, just because uh, if I find a pair of shoes that fit perfectly, I will continue wanting to buy from that company and get suggestions of, of things that will really, really fit. And providing more value, right? Because, like, mm. uh, if you're just like providing a bunch of products you can buy, that's not as engaging as being able to really teach people something new about themselves or about like how they find products that that really fit them. So I think that's one of the big trends we are already seeing, and and we'll see even more. Okay, okay. brilliant. brilliant. Uh, uh, one, one last, last question, question, and then we take uh, uh, questions question which will come to audience, audience or, or which the team have received directly. Um, as an entrepreneur, uh, an entrepreneur as an investor and an investor, uh, what would be your advice to startup entrepreneurs who are just coming into the entrepreneur space or have early ventures? Mm -hmm. What is important to think as a startup or as a founder? Yeah, Oof, many things, but <clears throat> one place you can look is though on uh, valerud.com. I've collected or we've collected lots of research resources mm -hmm. at the very bottom of the page. So like our favorite links um, to help people start companies. But I'm going to go back to the thing about like you need to create a great team. Um, mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to find good co-founders. And if you don't know where to find them, uh, think about like from their shoes, uh, what type of events would that person go to? So say you wanna um, start a computer vision company, mm. then you, or a company that, that solves something that requires computer vision, then you should not be going to like the business pitch events. Uh, you should go to the really deep tech uh, computer vision events like meetups and like hanging out at that, you know, that department of KTH and stuff, because that's where you will meet the right people. And I see that like people are hanging out in their bubbles and we need to start like cross fertilizing more. Okay, I think that's a very good learning and that's uh, where you pointed out the 
flaw in the education system, which kind of builds us vertically. That's where I think that fusion of ideas doesn't mm. happen. And then in professional life, if we are not networking in the right sense. Great. Marina, can you come in and uh, bring a couple of insights from the audience, which let's see if I can make you the presenter. Hold on. 10 seconds break. Uh, not exactly a break. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, Marina. Hi, Hi Marina. Hi, Naimo. So great Hi. to hear you talk at such a high level with so much experience. It's uh, yeah, great to listen to. And we have so many questions and very little time. So I'm just uh, close my eyes and pick one. I hope. Uh, it, I'm, yeah, I will just start with Eric Feminis. He had many questions. And uh, uh, one is, um, how important is a border government governance in a startup phase? And uh, if it is, how would you, um, yeah, if you can elaborate a little bit of. Yeah, it depends on what you mean. I think uh, having uh, advisors who've done similar journeys before is incredibly valuable. And that's great if they can sit on your board, but they can just also be um, advisors in the beginning. Thank you. Christina Obia Nordstrom asks, uh, do you, uh, how do you rate yourself as a venture capital uh, firm, I guess? Um, is your organization open right now to support startups? And if so, how can they get in touch with them? Yeah, so you can, um, I get all uh, form submissions from our website straight to my email uh, or caroline at valerud.com. Great, awesome. And I will just keep going so we get all the questions <laughs> in five minutes. So Michael Blair asks, um, what is your view on the future of ad tech, if you have any insights on that? Um, and can ad tech companies be useful or forceful in addressing uh, the point you made about the different disciplines not being connected, like the tech people not being meeting business people? And can ad tech be a platform for it, maybe connecting those communities? Uh, education or advertising? Tech? Yeah, sorry, education. education. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's super important. One of the biggest mistakes I think we did in Sweden at the start of this pandemic is we did this cottage permitting, like we let people go home with basically full pay, but didn't ask them to do anything. And obviously mm -hmm. what we should be doing with that free time is making sure that people are upskilling. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, there's, yeah, we, we need people with new digital skills and this is the time to do it. Um, so I definitely think that that's uh, an important part of the the solution. Great. So EPEC could be in, like focusing on moments like this and take the opportunity to upscale. Yeah. Never work. waste the crisis, right? Yeah, <laughs> that very good uh, good thinking. Um, yeah, and Joseph Haddad asks, uh, what is the ticket size when you invest? Uh, we invest up to ten million kroner, about one million dollars in total over the lifetime of the company. So usually the first investment is, you know, a few hundred thousand crowns or a few million crowns. All right. Sounds great. Um, good luck, Joseph. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then there is Thomas McKenna. He has a, a deep, deep tech startup um, and they work half with tech, half with neuroscience. And um, they are wondering what is the best way for them to be in uh, to get up, get in touch with VC networks to talk about you know potential investment. They're familiar with the academics platform like Nova and you know uh, open platforms that are open to mm -hmm. academia, but they wonder about VC funds. Yeah, I mean, a great way to get in touch is to be part of a university incubator or like Sting or Norwegian or something. Uh, things it can be worth joining those to just to be part of the community during like pitch events, things like that. Um, depending on what type of startup, usually like med tech investors don't invest as much in other things, et cetera. And I, I suggest looking at um, like a pitch book or a crunch base or Angelist, things like that. So like find which types of investors, like filter on like, have they done investments in your type of space? Uh, in the last two years or so. So you're making sure they're also active. Um, I think that uh, one thing that a lot of startups make a mistake in doing is uh, they kind of just mass email. Um, and it's much better if you can say, like, I looked at your website, I, I see you've done med tech and you did this investment in that company. Uh, we are also interesting for you in this way. Because a lot of investors just, they never look at hardware, for example, or wetware, or they'll never do med tech, like Volume uh, Ventures, we don't do med tech. 
so you should try to, you know, find something, uh, mm -hmm. find investors who are actually interested in you rather than just spamming. Right. Okay. That's a very valuable tip. Um, we will, um, yeah, uh, now I go back to Eric Dominguez. He had many questions. I will try to get through. Uh, in a startup phase, how important is the legal perspective and competence within the company? Ooh, depends. Uh, so sometimes it can be like very important to like file the right patents. Uh, for example, uh, you need to have good like basic legal documents. I really like startuptools.org uh, for like free legal documents. I think they have uh, made those for all, all of the Nordics. And they, there you can use stuff that's, you know, checked by a lawyer uh, and like standard, like investors won't get, you know, shocked if you're using these documents. Awesome. Oh, that's um, great tips, very concrete. Um, yeah, and then uh, how many founders are optimal for a startup when you want to invest? It's, there's no optimal number, but I'd say like two to five. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's tricky. Like, and the, there's some weird setups where like one founder has 90% and the other one has 10 or something. And then the question is, okay, how come? Are you not equal partners? Are you not building this together? Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, there, there can be questions around that. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's very individual. And, and what feels safer for an investor perspective? To have 50-50 or 30-30? Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, near uh, even, I'd say. Okay, that's yeah. okay. Um, yeah, and then Christine again asks, um, uh, you have a very, you know, track record of success and that's uh, super inspiring to hear. And she was a bit curious about where were the failures that you maybe learned from? Or oh, man. I mean, so of... many. So, when, I mean, I've been, I've been uh, fired. <laughs> I've, I've not gotten jobs I really wanted. Um, uh, with Volumental, uh, I realized, I think I didn't handle the CEO role as well as I should have. I was bad at delegating. Um, I took on too much, which meant that I, it wasn't fun anymore. And I, I mean, it's kind of sad that I had to or wanted to leave that that CEO role. So, uh, yeah. Um, other things, I mean, uh, I think uh, like really figuring out how to as quickly as possible figure out like, is this a good match or not as an investor, like between us and the, and the startup. So we're not wasting people's time uh, is something we can always get better at. Thank you for sharing. Now you sound more human. <laughs> <laughs> Very human. Yeah, no, I prioritize hard. And there's a lot of things I, I uh, have had to, you know, I don't do because I do spend so much time on learning new things and doing startups. That's awesome. Yeah, sounds, um, yeah, sounds great journey. You had really, we can hear your experience and uh, yeah, with all the ups and downs. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then yeah. another question from Joseph. Naimula will keep going until you cut me off. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking we can probably, uh, Caroline, it depends on your time as well. Maybe a couple of more minutes if we have one or two last ones. I mean, I'm fine. I have no, I have uh, a <laughs> few minutes. So we can go on if you want to, but yeah, you decide. Okay, we, we, we can continue for a few minutes. Uh, so yeah. Marina, you can bring in the next one. I just like to point out, because Caroline, you were mentioning, uh, mentioning a very interesting thing, like uh, the 9010 startup. Uh, mm -hmm. like two founders. So I think that's never a good situation because it essentially uh, doesn't show to the world that you are equally invested. So uh, when we are um, advising early stage entrepreneurs at Companion Stockholm, we always advise them to uh, have democratic setup at the yep. core founding team. Because if you are three, it's good to have three equal ones because then it's easier to kind of drive it together as three equally fast running wheels or four. You can't have a three wheel car. Yeah. Four wheel car is good. Yeah. Yeah. No, and that's fair. And like one thing that happens if you're like ten founders, then obviously like you're already very diluted. Um, exactly. So depending on how you do with VCs and stuff, I mean, you probably you're going to dilute through investor funding with like 50, 60, 80%. And yeah. if you've already diluted a lot, that's an issue. And the thing is like, so if you go in and you say, okay, you get 
somehow that means you don't really trust the other person or you're not sure they're gonna like be contributing equally. And then you should have tested that out before writing the shareholders agreement. Mm. And then what you also do, of course, is to have vesting. So you're very clear on like how much are we expected to work? And if we're not, you know, if one person wants to leave, yes, you can do that, but that means you also lose your shares. Mm. Um, so, so that's at least some of your shares. So that's the, um, I mean, I think that founders in general think like, oh, but I had the idea or uh, I joined like three months earlier than you, mm. so I should have more ownership. But like once you're like five, eight, ten years in, which is what it usually often takes, like those few months in the beginning matter nothing uh, compared yeah. to the work you're putting in together. There we go. Got it. I think that's a very good learning. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Marina, do we have more? Well, we do. We yeah, let, let's put more about it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we have a, a very concrete question from jo- Joseph again. He's asking, uh, would you consider investing in a startup in Lean Shopping or outside Stockholm in general? And do you invest in pre-seed stage? Uh, any specific sector, but I guess you already said that, but yeah. yeah. Yes, yes, the, to the two first ones. So, I mean, currently, so the last... Uh, well, we, I have a new one I can't talk about much in Uppsala. And the one before that uh, was Swedish Algae Factory, which is the biotech startup, really cool in uh, Gothenburg. We have Econo, which is uh, AI for Internet of Things, uh, making industrial processes much more effective. And that's in um, Varberg, which is outside Gothenburg and Borås. And uh, Grafmatech, which is a graphing company, is in Uppsala. Uh, and then Volumental and Bracebox are in Stockholm. So we're like, yeah, all over Sweden works. Uh, what we say is we want it to be within like a three hour commute from Stockholm-ish um, so that we can regularly like visit the startups like once a month uh, at least uh, and be with them physically in their office. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Then it's a yes. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, as an investor, Eric has... If as an investor, you analyze the, the educational background of the startup or the founding team um, during the DD, which I'm not sure what it is, but maybe you do. The DD due diligence, probably. Yeah. So <laughs> understanding like the details of, of everything we need to know if we're going to invest. Uh, educational background. I mean, to me, education is a wide concept. I mean, of course, it's important that the founders uh, understand their customer mm-hmm. and have an idea of how they're going to solve the problem and ideally have the technical, uh, some of the technical expertise to solve it. And especially, there's such a war on talent now for tech. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's really great to have tech founders uh, who are already in the space, uh, who can then like hire their their friends uh, and such. Uh, I'll just add one point here, maybe for a very specific area, for example, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, having ex- subject matter knowledge is very important, like having good uh, grip over there. For example, I had a, a med tech startup uh, which had a strong subject matter team. So they were able to raise very early investment very fast because yeah. the people knew the game, how the medical sector worked. They had relevant experiences being doctors and all. Yeah. So in some yeah. sectors, it's important to have the technical. Yeah, not just the uh, development tech, but the subject knowledge of the field that you're going in with the startup. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is especially important, obviously, in deep tech startups, because the, the whole point of a deep tech startup is that there is a new innovation at the core, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty hard to have unless you have that technical um, expertise. Right. So it's not really about the educational academic background or like the, the certificate to having certified knowledge from a, an academic institution or such, yeah. but it's more about the experience and being plugged in that is maybe more interesting. Uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, we look for very smart founders who are able to, you know, think flexibly and integrate new information uh, as it comes, uh, and obviously, and learn new skills. Because if we are going to build a huge company together, it means that it's a very different job being like a startup founder the first year compared to like when you're IPO'd, right? So uh, you need to be smart, and then of course, like an educational background can signal something. Uh, but there's lots of great people who choose the entrepreneurial path because they somehow don't fit into the normal like cookie cutter mode of like mm-hmm. 
good person, you know, like a, a like yes. they don't like fit into the university system. They don't do tests well or, or something. And then of course, entrepreneurship is um, a great way because then they're building their own thing. They don't need to get hired by someone else. I mean, right. that's true for me, right? I, I applied for lots of jobs when I came back from Cambridge and I had like a, um, like a neuro natural sciences degree. Um, and in Sweden, they really didn't want to look at that because they didn't see the transferable skills and mm -hmm. the fact that I had proven that I can learn fast. They instead yeah. said, well, you didn't study economics or uh, so you can't have this job, mm -hmm. which, you know, means then that people like me are more likely than to go out and, and uh, find their own path. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Brilliant. Uh, Marina, if, yeah. <laughs> I think we can probably <laughs> close the event. I think the uh, uh, audience have been with us. Uh, thank you. So I would first of all like to thank the community who has joined us for this uh, very interesting and insightful discussion with uh, Caroline. Caroline, thank you so much for being here. Marina, thank you so much for taking up the uh, questions uh, side and bringing all this uh, together. Uh, all of the Startup Grind Stockholm team. Thanks to everyone. And do join our upcoming next week's event on Friday with the mayor of Stockholm. All Ask all your questions. It'll be great. Thank you once again, Caroline, for today. And best of luck, everyone, as we start the new year. Yes. Uh, you have something. Yes. Yeah, can I say something quickly? Yeah, please, please, uh, Karina is giving so much value. And I just wanted to tell to everybody who is listening that are asking, oh, can she repeat that? Or, you know, um, we will take the recording and then we will do, um, uh, like, we will collect your best uh, tip, uh, tips. And so you can find that in the Startup Grind LinkedIn page as the post coming up within this week uh, for all the people listening. So. Yeah. And again, like, as I mentioned, you can email me, carolyn at valerie.com. You've got my LinkedIn, you've got my mentors LinkedIn, you've got valerie.com, which I've collected lots of resources. So, you know, it's, mm, right. there's awesome. lots of places to go for uh, more information. Uh, okay. Caroline, maybe if you can write your email, because somebody, I just saw they were requesting the spelling. So maybe you can write it in the chat. Yes. Uh, yeah, if that's the way you receive the information. Yeah, I, I like uh, I like email. I don't like LinkedIn messages and such that much. If, uh, okay. you know, if you have to choose, email is my social media of choice. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day and a lovely year ahead, everyone. Thank you, Caroline. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Marina. Nice Thank to meet you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.